Well, good afternoon. As fantastic as this colloquium has been, we saved the very best for last. And so I'm very pleased to introduce our last panel on um, Israeli-Palestinian relations. Our moderator is Chris Eisgruber, who's from the Princeton, the great class of 1983. He's also the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Public Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School. He's also affiliated with the University Center for Human Values. He's also our provost. And did I mention that he's the new president-elect of Princeton University? <laughs> and we knew him when. Um, joining him on the panel is Dan Kurtzer, who's the S. Daniel Abraham Professor in Middle Eastern Policy Studies here at the Woodrow Wilson School. And as many of you know, he's the former U.S. Ambassador to Israel and Egypt. We also have Steve Simon, who's from the MPA class of 1983. He's the Executive Director of, Interna of International Institute for Strategic Studies in the United States, and he's the Corresponding Director of ISS, IISS in the Middle East. We have Rob Malley, who's the Program Director of Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group, and Tamara Wittes, who's Director and Senior Fellow in Foreign Policy at the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. Welcome, and thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Cece, and, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming back. It's uh, terrific to have you uh, all of here, uh, all of you here with us uh, this afternoon for uh, this uh, terrific uh, colloquium, um, and I'm delighted to be uh, a part of it. We have a fabulous uh, panel here, so uh, I'm going to launch right in with uh, questions to them. We're going to do this as uh, as other panels have done in a kind of Q and A. Uh, format, and uh, we will do our best to leave about 30 minutes for uh, questions uh, at the end of the panel. I know we're running a few minutes late, but I'm going to try to end us on time. I know you've all been here for uh, a long day, and uh, that's terrific of you, particularly with the great sunshine and wonderful weather that we have uh, outside right now. So let me start with one question that I'm going to uh, ask to Dan Kurtzer first, but ask uh, each of our panelists to comment upon if, uh, if they're so inclined, uh, which is this. The Associated Press distributed a story headlined, Israel and Palestinians closing in on resumed peace talks. And then the, the subhead explained that both sides welcomed Arab League flexibility on land swaps. Is this a good time for a major push for peace? Why or why not? Dan, why don't you start us off? Well, you asked us to uh, give brief answers. The answer is yes. It, it always is. <laughs> Tomorrow. And thank you very much. <laughs> no, I, I think the AP story is uh, overly optimistic and uh, suggests something that is still not there. Secretary Kerry is clearly very engaged, and he's trying to move things across a wide front, trying to bring about conditions for resumed negotiations, trying to build some economic progress into the uh, process, uh, as happened this past week, getting the Arab League to re re reiterate the Arab Peace Initiative. Uh, but I think we're pretty far away yet from uh, a kind of optimistic assessment. The reason I, I answered yes, that this is the time, is because there is never a wrong time to try to make progress on this issue. Uh, it is uh, so vexing and so chronic and such a problem uh, not just for the people in the region, but also for us, as heavily invested as we are, that uh, it, it's, uh, it's very good, I think, that the administration has uh, revived its efforts uh, as early in the second term as, as is happening. Tomorrow. Uh, thanks, and, and thanks for having me here. Um, and let me start by saying how delighted I am that you're having not one, not two, but three Brookings scholars at your conference today. Uh, I, I agree with Dan that this is a good time, uh, or rather that there is no bad time. Uh, and I think that, that the primary reason for that is that uh, when this process isn't moving forward, it's usually degrading. It doesn't just stay there on the back burner waiting patiently uh, for you to turn your attention to it. And, uh, and it's not a conflict where uh, if you wait, it will get riper. In fact, I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is that the domestic politics, both in Israel and uh, in Palestine, have gotten harder in terms of uh, creating grounds for peace. I'll, I'll give Kerry credit for noting that in order to shift the dynamic, you need to work not only on uh, technical or economic or 
or other day-to-day -day things, but also on the diplomatic side, and using the Arab states and, and the reiteration of the Arab Peace Initiative to try and build diplomatic momentum as well as momentum on the ground. Rob. Uh, you want a brief answer? Uh, the two-state solution is swimming against the tide. The Palestinians are divided, and they have other preoccupations. The Israelis seem quite complacent without thinking that this is their priority. The Arab world is internally focused and also has other preoccupations. We have other priorities, and yet we have no choice but to try. But we can't try and ignore everything I said above. In our efforts, we have to take we have to be fully aware of the fact that we are swimming against the tide and that almost all of the dynamics in the region are heading in a different direction. Steve. I agree with uh, my colleagues. <laughs> uh, naturally, I would just add, uh, maybe just as, as a gloss, that it's uh, commonly held to be true that um, attempts at resuscitating negotiations which then fail can have a damaging effect on the politics of the region and can lead um, to um, uh, negative uh, uh, developments, particularly on the Palestinian side, uh, when these efforts fail. So um, there is a risk that the administration takes and that the Israeli and Palestinian governments, for that matter, are taking in moving forward on this. I feel like I'm in the odd position of moderating a panel on Israel and Palestine and having to force a disagreement. Uh, not what I uh, anticipated when that, uh, that topic was uh, presented. But let, let me just play this back to each of you and make sure that I understand the answer. Because each of you has, in a way, said yes to the question. It's a good time for a push. But if I'm, if I'm reading you right, you all agree that it's yes to the question because we always need to be uh, pushing. And there's nothing particularly propitious about this time. Well, I, I think that's true. Uh, there, there is nothing particularly propitious. And in fact, um, those who, who do the analysis of what might be called the objective factors, the politics in Palestine, the politics in Israel, and the politics and priorities in Washington have a strong case to make that um, we should be focusing on enough other things that we should not invest here. But as you heard, uh, the problem is that status quos in the Middle East in this peace process or lack of peace process are not static. And if we're not trying to push that ball back up the hill, it's going to come back and hurt us. The, the, the point I, I think that Steve made that needs a little emphasis and maybe a point of some disagreement, I don't think it's a question simply of uh, failure being a big problem. It's how we might fail. If we fail by allowing the parties to dictate terms and then not pushing them as far and as, as hard as we can, then in fact it could be worse for having tried. And unfortunately, in the past uh, 10, 15 years, that has happened more often than not, where we have launched an effort to try to get to negotiations. One side or the other or both have pushed back, and we've kind of walked away. And in that case, we've raised expectations, and, and there's problems on the ground. It's where I would then argue that we have to take a seriously leading role. We've got to be the diplomatic maestro of this process. And we haven't really done that for, I think, about 20 years, actually. Can I follow yeah, up on that, if I may? Because I think Dan's getting at something very interesting, which is, you know, how, how does the United States treat this conflict? How do we treat efforts to resolve it? Is it as something that would be nice to do? Uh, or is it something that's in our national interests? Uh, You've occasionally heard American officials say things like, we can't want peace more than the parties. But if President Obama takes seriously the case that he laid out in his speech in Jerusalem a few weeks ago, uh, we, we do have a strong interest in seeing this conflict resolved and in seeing the alternatives to a, a negotiated resolution staved off. Uh, because a continuation of the conflict uh, to the point where Israel is facing the choice between becoming a, a binational state or becoming some kind of very oppressive uh, non-democratic state. That's a choice that is deeply not in America's interests. Uh, so I think you know, to pick up the challenge that, that Dan's put down is to take seriously the idea that a two-state solution is an American priority in America's national interest. It's not just something we do for the sake of the parties. And if that's the case, then we need to be willing to push. 
Dan, Dan mentioned in the beginning of his answer kind of three variables in this, the, the state of politics in Israel, the state of politics in Palestine, and the state of politics here in the United States. And then, Tamara, you, you mentioned the, the question of the two-state solution, which, Rob, you had alluded to as well. Would you say a bit more, Rob, about where, where the two-state solution stands right now within Israeli politics? Is there support for it somewhere within the dynamic, or is that eroding? I mean, it has been eroding on both sides, not, I mean, because neither side believes in it anymore. You know, I, one point I'd make, and this is, you know, maybe we want some disagreement, so I'll, I'll try to put it in, in a sharper way. Um, it's fair to, it's f fine to say that the, it's in the U.S. national interest that we need uh, to want it. We can't ignore the fact that it has failed time and time again, and there are reasons why it's failed. It's not simply because the U.S. hasn't been involved enough. There have been times where the U.S. has been deeply involved. There's been times when the configurations on the Palestinian-Israeli side actually looked quite promising. Uh, there have been times when the Arabs have been involved, and it hasn't worked, and I think it's not, for me, it's not simply a matter of wanting it and being determined. It's understanding why it failed, and I think we learned this morning a lot um, Ambassador Crocker's talk and others, there was an emphasis on the fact that we have to be modest and that we're playing away games, I think was his, was his uh, expression, which I think is a, a very insightful one. If we, haven't, if we Americans haven't succeeded, there's, there, there's beyond our incompetence, which could be a big part of the explanation, <laughs> there are other reasons as well. And those have to do with the dynamics in the region, the dynamics in Israel, the dynamics on the Palestinian side, which have not lent themselves to the kind of so neat solutions that we as Americans like to think make perfect sense. Let me jump, you yep. bandwagon with, uh, with Rob on this. <clears throat> I just came back from a couple of weeks in Israel and um, I've been in government for a number of years um, during which I spoke to the same three Israelis you know, every day. Um, and then I get out of government, I go to Israel and I speak to 100 Israelis um, and find out that um, uh, you know, the focus of, um, of discourse for the previous two years actually had nothing to do with currents in Israeli society. And uh, the project I went over there to work on has to do with um, uh, creating conditions that would uh, foster a two-state solution uh, in Israel. And my conversations were, I mean, on one level, they were hilarious because I'd sit down with people and say, well, as I'm here to talk about the two-state solution, I give this mystified look. Like, are you still talking about that? Uh, have you just dropped in from some other planet? As, as happens, I had. Um, and, you know, I think it works not just in terms of the, um, you know, the social context, you know, of Israel, what's going on in society, but it's also implicitly driving Israeli policy. So if you look at um, uh, the actual direction of Israel's strategic and and in a certain perverse sense, diplomatic efforts vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, they're very much directed at Hamas. And they're directed at Hamas because Israel, the Israeli government, the current Israeli government and Hamas share an outlook on the conflict um, that, uh, well, it's a common outlook, really. Neither side wants a two-state solution particularly. Um, as certainly, the one side doesn't know how to get there. The other side, we know, doesn't you know, really want one. Um, uh, each side feels that some kind of long-term truce is really in, in its best interest. No major concessions, but no major upheaval uh, either. Whereas at the same time, the professed um, uh, advocate on the Palestinian side of a two-state solution, Abu Mazen, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is uh, you know the proverbial other woman. I mean, he's just kind of hanging out there while uh, the Israeli government works both directly uh, and indirectly via the Egyptian government with Hamas. And I think that really suggests um, the uphill battle vis-a-vis -vis the two-state solution that the uh, Obama administration will be facing as it pursues uh, this latest gambit. So tell me where this leads us in terms of our realistic response from the United States. Tamara, I thought I heard you say that anything other than the two-state solution is disastrous from the standpoint of American interests and we had better care a lot. And Rob and Steve, I think I've heard you say the support just isn't there when you actually I go to the Middle East. you're finally driving a wedge here. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I have to admit that I, I was spoiled because about midway in my career, I, I worked on the peace team of Secretary of State James Baker, who knew how to do this. 
and he did it the right way. And he did it with the backing of a president who had a great amount of strength. He had just come out victorious from the uh, first Gulf War. And Baker did not take no for an answer. We got no's. We got no's from Shamir, who is no, no less challenging to deal with than Benjamin Netanyahu. And we got no's from Hafez al-Assad. And Baker simply wouldn't take no for an answer, not knowing that he would be able to turn that ultimately into yeses. The point is that US diplomatic finesse, uh, pressure, expertise, persistence, and the fact that everybody knew that we wanted to do this made a difference at the end. And I think that's what's required. I, I call it the diplomatic maestro. You can find some other term. You know, I, why give in to the, the worst dispositions of the two sides? Yeah, a lot of people in Israel would like to <coughs> export the problem. It's Jordan's problem. Or, you know, let the Palestinians live without a state. A lot of people in Palestine want to hold out for everything. We're not prepared to compromise because we're, we'd like everything. It's not going to work. And it won't work, or it will continue not to work, as long as we sit back and allow them to dictate the terms. So this agrees. It does, it, we do have to be pushing for the two-state solution oh, yes. and push hard. Yeah, well, Mara. I, OK. Um, in, in the interest of generating some drama on the panel, I, I'm going to put forward the notion that um, while the US playing this uh, assertive mediation role is crucial, it's insufficient. Uh, and, and I think that what Baker had going for him was not only a strong president who was determined to do this and, and to back him up, but he also had changes in the regional environment that made the United States a strong actor in that context. The challenge that has been discussed all day long at this conference for the United States is whether we are in a position of demandeur in the region or not. And um, the region is undergoing tremendous wrenching change. And there are a lot of calls across the region for more robust American leadership. Uh, I believe that in some ways, this can help us uh, in the diplomatic process of re-engaging on Arab-Israeli peace. But there are other ways in which it complicates our ability to play that role. And one of the most difficult things facing the Obama administration is setting its priorities in this region. Um, how much energy are you going to devote to uh, Palestinian-Israeli peace relative to containing the Syrian crisis? For example, if there are synergies there, positive synergies, fantastic. But we better figure out what they are and exploit them. Um, and I'm not sure that we've done that. I, and Tamara, I, your advice for the Obama administration on that? Well, <laughs> my, my, my advice, well, my hunch is that there are some synergies. But they are synergies that will drive the United States into a much deeper engagement in the region than I think is in any way the inclination of this president and this White House, or frankly, the American public right now. And, but my own argument would be that the United States can't afford uh, to, to remain relatively disengaged. And I don't think we're, we're disengaged, but relatively disengaged from the Middle East. And that means we have to work the peace process. Yeah, Rob, did you want just, to just a few reactions. I mean, I've always, for the last 10 years, I've been an advocate of, of, of greater US engagement. But again, I think it ha we have to do it with our eyes open. The big difference with Baker, I've always thought, and I didn't have the privilege of working with him, he was trying to get them to the table. That's hard enough. We're asking them to make existential compromises on the final status. I don't think that in that case you could say we're not going to take no for an answer. We may have to take no for an answer. So I think there's a big difference with the, and I don't want to demean what he did, but the, the more procedural effort that he was engaged in and the more substantive effort that President Clinton and then uh, since then others, President Bush and now President Obama, we're in a different phase of the conflict. Um, and I agree with what, uh, with what Tamar said. I think there is, the US has a different place in the region for reasons that have not partially to do with our role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, partially to do with Iraq, partially to do with the inevitable decline of a superpower that is no longer the only power. And just to, 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 to uh, echo what she said, I, got a, I was talking to a, a, an Arab who's been long, long militant for, uh, and the, uh, for uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace, and he said, are you kidding? Is the US now focusing on Israeli-Palestinian peace, given everything that's happening in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon? Now is the time that they're making this a priority? And I think we have to contend with that, too. It's not just here that there are other priorities. People there some are looking at this with some, some of them. In Israel, 
but also in the Arab world. Some people are looking at it with an air of disbelief, which doesn't mean, again, I'm not, I'm not a pessimist. I don't think that we, I certainly don't think we could abandon it. But let's go, let's go to it with our eyes open. And let's not, I mean, just to, to add to something that Steve said, uh, simply getting back to negotiations. If that's the goal, that's the wrong goal. Negotiations, and then two days later, they leave. That's, in my view, worse. And I don't see what purpose it serves. And I've heard many people say, well, you need to have something going on, because otherwise, uh, you may have violence. People are going to despair. I think the Israelis and Palestinians are wise enough to know when a negotiation is a kabuki process and when it's real. And if it's a kabuki process, it's not going to make it. Robin, your view, the right goal? Is it the same thing that Tamara and Dan have stated, or is it anything different? No, the right goal is to get a two-state solution, but we may have to go through different, uh, you know, it might take us longer to get there than I think all four of us would hope. Let me, let me ask you about one thing that uh, uh, was in the newspaper this uh, morning, news reports about uh, China having offered to serve as a kind of uh, mediator in the Middle East process. Both Netanyahu and Abu Mazen will be there within the next week. Is this um, helpful, harmful, or irrelevant? <laughs> Look, I, I've argued for actually for years that um, the uh, United States monopoly over uh, peace process activities should be uh, broadened. And, and we should no longer uh, pretend that we are the only ones from the outside who can um, hope to dictate terms. Uh, 10 years ago, we helped create the quartet, the UN, the European Union, and Russia. Uh, if China is now interested and seriously uh, uh, committed to trying to move this thing forward, I would embrace it, but I would work with them behind the scenes so that they shape something that's meaningful and not just do a kind of catering for peace. Uh, you know, just have a conference and a photo op and then everybody goes home. Your, your version of the worst, or, or maybe uh, uh, not even serious enough to be the worst. I just, I don't know, dance, dance <laughs> the thought of that. Um, uh, many years ago, watching from afar Israelis and, and Chinese uh, negotiating over uh, missile interception technologies, and I just thought watching them negotiate with each other that they really deserved one another. <laughs> yeah. but I, I, don't, I don't want to pursue that thought. I, uh, you know what? Uh, a, a point I wanted to, to um, uh, underscore is just the you know the regional environment, and, and we have all said something yep. about that. I just think the regional environment is now more than ever uh, inconducive um, uh, to negotiations and. You know, you know, from the president's perspective, as at least as I as I perceived it, uh, and and which he tried to impart to his uh, you know Israeli counterparts, and, and we all did, was that given all the uncertainties in the region now, all the variables um, just you know vibrating violently on Israel's periphery, that uh, it would do well to take control of at least some of them and turn them into constants, really, and just you know, hold them constant. And that um, the offer of uh, mediated peace talks with the Palestinians was, in effect, um, uh, an off-ramp. Mm. And, and this would stand uh, Israel in good strategic stead, because then it could focus on some truly serious threats um, uh, to its security. And as it happens, the Israelis really didn't, you know, accept that argument. Um, uh, whereas we were arguing that, you know, all the uh, all the instability, all the volatility, was a reason to act vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. The Israelis saw the volatility as a reason uh, to um, descend into a deep crouch, really. And um, you know, the events of the past year have tended to bear out in their view, um, uh, this uh, you know, very cautious posture. So for example, uh, as, as uh, we now know, because it's appeared at least in the Israeli papers, um, uh, the United States was close to working a deal with the Syrians for the return of the Golan um, uh, to Syria from Israel in exchange for uh, an abrogation of the Syrian-Iranian security relationship. 
kind of a big deal. In any case, um, this, the Israelis never bought that, and now they look back at their reticence at that moment, and they say, well, you see, it's actually a good thing that we didn't do that, because if we had given up the Golan, right now we'd have um, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, these, uh, these jihadists, sitting on, sitting on the Golan. So actually, we were wise not to do this. And then, you know, they can extrapolate from that scenario, say, to Palestine and, and, and say, how long will it be until the Arab Spring sweeps away the Palestinian Authority? What, what will we gain by agreeing with, with this um, ephemeral uh, a, a power, uh, you know, on our border, or that would be on our border, um, in the wake of all this instability in the region. So I think we just have to bear in mind that the way the Israelis are interpreting uh, the, uh, the strategic environment uh, right now is, uh, is unhelpful. So Steve, does that lead you to a different recommendation than any of your uh, co-panelists, for example, on the question that Tamara raised about what the administration's priorities should be in the Middle East? Should the United States be effectively buying time on the uh, Israel-Palestine uh, problem while trying to produce more stability on some other well, boundary certainly, or sector. You know, the, the, the challenge that the Israelis have put to the United States is, well, you know, why don't you go produce some stability? You know, and then we'll talk about it, and we say, well, you know, okay, sure, uh, be right back. <laughs> uh, uh, look, I just two thoughts on that. Oh, one is that, um, you know, the amount of effort you expend on something is commensurate with your assessment of how big an interest it really is and an assessment of how likely you are to be successful and what the costs of failure are. We've all had different kind of views on that. Um, the other uh, is, uh, the other is a, is a thought actually that um, uh, Ryan um, put forward in his, in his remarks today at lunch where he was talking about the, the um, uh, the Pakistanis, I think it was, and he said, well, you need to kind of just keep working to reorient their strategic concept, you know, the concept that, that regulates, um, uh, you know, their policies. And I think, you know, it probably behooves us to be doing that with the Israelis, and that's a matter of, you know, it's a long-term, you know, process of intensive diplomacy and interaction. Dan. You know, one of, one of the big think issues that, that has pervaded each of these panels today is whether or not the United States is a declining power in this region. And I would say that our discussion, even at the outset, is, is very much uh, a part and parcel of this question. Because to the extent that we look at the uh, changes in the Arab world and buy into an assessment that um, let's just bury our head in the sand and expose that part of the anatomy that Ryan Crocker talked about exposing if we pivoted away from this region. Uh, to that extent, we are, um, it's self-fulfilling analysis. We become a defeatist declining power. Now, that doesn't mean that by activating a serious American approach and a big strategy that we can solve this thing. But the Israelis in this case who make the argument that the regional environment forces them to hunker down are wrong. They are plain wrong, because what they're allowing is a very short-term concern about what's happening in their surrounding area to overlook the fact that they still have a problem inside their house. And how they solve that problem can either work to their advantage, meaning they come up with some kind of an arrangement, the dynamics of which um, we largely know from negotiations that they've held over the years, the substance of which we know, or it can lead to a perpetuation of the problem inside the house and exacerbate their overall security. And we shouldn't buy into that. Well, let me ask you all about the character of the problem inside the house, so to speak, right now. I think uh, earlier, Tamara, you had said that the situation is always degrading if it's not being uh, kept up. Uh, earlier this week, there was news uh, that an Israeli had been stabbed in the uh, West Bank, followed on the same day, I think, by a targeted killing by Israel in Gaza, are, are we on the precipice right now of escalating uh, violence or, or maybe beyond the precipice of it? Well, I don't know that we're, you never know when you're on the pre precipice of a new <laughs> intifada. Um, but what I, what I would say is that we've seen slow degradation in various ways on both sides. I mean, we've already talked about the changes inside Israeli politics, the way they view the changes in the region, the impact that that's had on their strategic thinking 
On the Palestinian side, what you've had is a slow, inexorable degradation of the legitimacy of the authority, the Palestinian Authority, which was created to help implement this peace process. Um, and the, the sort of um, final manifestation of this was the resignation of Salam Fayyad, who was the, the prime minister uh, chosen by the United States and the quartet and, um, and uh, fed, clothed, and housed, essentially, as prime minister of the Palestinian Authority for many years by uh, all we external sponsors of the peace process. And that was in an effort to freeze Palestinian politics uh, and replace it with something that was technocratic and effective and cared about good governance and security. Um, but underneath that, Palestinian politics was still going on. And the intense rivalry between Fatah and Hamas was still there. Salam Fayyad never built a popular base uh, and ultimately could not stand in the face of these two parties that did have popular bases, both of whom were determined to bring him down. Um, so in a way, we now have a clarified uh, situation inside Palestine, but it's not one that is conducive to negotiations, both because of those internal dynamics and because of what Steve said, that the Israelis, frankly, are much more interested in engaging with Hamas right now in their own way than they are engaging with Abu Mazen. So to any of you then, with that, with that diagnosis and, and uh, anyone who wants to disagree with that or supplement should uh, feel free to do so, but with that diagnosis of uh, the available negotiating uh, partners in the politics within Palestine, plus the need for the United States to engage, how should the United States be engaging with Palestine in particular? How should it be responding to that domestic politics in Palestine? I, I've thought for, for quite some time that, that we should not be the ones to determine whether or not the Palestinians reconcile among themselves. We can make our choices with respect to uh, whom we decide to talk to. And so it may be uh, the right policy not to talk to Hamas as long as they don't meet the conditions that have been laid out. But I don't see why that should prevent uh, Fatah and Hamas from finding a way to get together as long as the conditions of the government that's formed conform to uh, what would be a reasonable basis for a peace process. In other words, if Hamas is ready to come into a government which is then ready to negotiate with Israel, even if Hamas stands aside and says, we don't like negotiations, it's a little bit akin to the former Israeli foreign minister, Lieberman, who was the foreign minister but opposed what Israel was doing in the peace process. There's individual responsibility that wasn't being exercised, but then there's governmental guidelines that, that uh, should govern. So I think the first thing we should do is not interfere if the Palestinians decide to reconcile. Number two, which is a bit more controversial, um, I think the conditions we put on Hamas are the right ones to expect at the end of a process, but we've given them only a black and white uh, binary here. Either they accept them or they don't, and we have no way of in a sense, conditioning them to begin accepting those conditions in return for the beginning of some change in our own policy. And I think we need to think that through. I, I, mean, I agree with, yeah. with, with what Dan said. Uh, I think, and it starts on also a premise, I think, that many Israelis recognize, and it was implicit in, in what Steve said, uh, the notion that a conflict of this nature can be resolved by a party that is divided. I don't know of any. I mean, I, and I'm, I was a student of national liberation movements. I don't know of any that was this divided that could actually cross the finish line. Either one side, and either there's an internal civil war and one side defeats the other, as in Algeria, uh, in the Algerian national liberation movement, or they, they come together. But to have them divided this way, you could move, you can make progress, but I don't know that it's going to be satisfactory to Palestinians or to Israelis. If I were an Israeli, I would ask the question that, 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 that Steve was asking. Who am I actually making peace with? Who am I signing this piece of paper with? So I think that's uh, on that point. On the um, issue of whether an uprising is, is, is around the corner or not, I mean, as, as Tamara said, these, these things tend to be unthinkable beforehand and then inevitable uh, in hindsight. So you know, rep, <laughs> same with the Egypt, Tunisia. Uh, objectively, all the conditions for an uprising are there. I mean, you have a, a process that nobody believes in. You have an, whatever economic growth, relatively artificial economic growth on the, on, in the West Bank is now uh, is, 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 is eroding uh, in, in quite precipitously. You have increasing sense among Palestinian security forces 
what are we actually doing? Whose security are we actually uh, uh, promoting? Um, so it's a bit like the cartoon character who runs over the cliff and who could keep running until he looks down and then, then he falls. They don't want to look down. I mean, that's, that's what's keeping it whole, is that Palestinians at this point don't want another chaotic uh, uprising as they lived through not long ago. They're still licking the wounds from, from the second intifada. I think they know what it would mean. So there's no appetite in a, among a minority, perhaps, but among the vast majority, there's no appetite. But again, I, I wouldn't, you know, so I wouldn't be surprised if things continue like this for some time, but I wouldn't be shocked either if we wake up one morning and one of these incidents of which any number could happen involving settlers or, or car accident is what happened in the first intifada. I mean, you know, something happened in, in Gaza in the first intifada. Something could trigger an uprising because, as I said, all of the ingredients are there. We've talked a, a bit about the uh, Israeli politics, uh, a bit about the Palestinian politics. Let me ask a question about the third triad in the American uh, uh, politics, and then one more after that, and we'll go to questions from the audience. All of you have said that the United States needs to have the will to stick to this uh, process. Are the uh, necessary ingredients there uh, for the United States to uh, behave that way? Steve. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Rob. You know, after, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> after you know, everything that happened in, in 2011, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's amazing that the administration has um, you know, gotten into the fray uh, at all. Uh, it was, uh, shall we say, an annus horribilis um, in, uh, in US-Israeli you know, relations, that is to say, in the wake of uh, President Obama putting forward the, um, the shattering and really outrageous notion that there might be, you know, some territorial compromise in the context of a final status accord between Israel and Palestine. Um, that, uh, and, and the president um, probably paid a political price. I mean, you know, you don't really know because the polling, um, uh, it, in terms of American Jews and, and, and the November elections was so fragmentary and really unreliable because it's just partial exit polling really that, that they depend on. So nobody really knows uh, how big a penalty uh, the, uh, the Democrats paid um, uh, you know, owing to the events of 2011 and the serious efforts that um, a certain segment of the Friends of Israel in the United States um, you know, certain effort that they made uh, to uh, uh, facilitate the, uh, the, the, the defeat of, of Obama in the November election. So um, anyway, against all that, I'm really surprised that, uh, that he's gotten back into this. Of course, he's got uh, Kerry, whom he can hang out to dry. Um, you know, so it's not as though um, he has uh, he has no options if things <laughs> if things don't work out. Not that he would do that, but um, uh, you know there is it is mediated. Let me just let me let me just uh, you know, put it uh, you know put it that way. The uh, National Security Council is the less humorous place ever since Steve left. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, well, let me. Let me end with one question asking uh, each of you if you're willing to give uh, a, a piece of specific advice either to the uh, administration and the president uh, uh, or to Secretary Kerry as he uh, tries to avoid being hung out to, uh, dry by uh, his uh, boss. Steve, do you want to start? You know, I have an exit strategy. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I, I think you know the the sum total of the of the discussion here suggests that it's a very risky undertaking. Um, it's it it does align with U.S. interests um, at least to some degree. Um, that it, the the moment is not going to become more propitious down the road. Yeah. Because things will probably only get worse. Um, uh, so. So why not? Um, there's been a, a pretty positive, uh, uh, you know, presidential visit to Israel, you know, that I think um, uh, put a bit of oil on on on, uh, on roiled waters, uh, and and maybe the mood is a little bit difficult, um, but maybe there's some possibilities too. I just I just add, you know. It, to something Rob said, which is just to focus a bit more on the Palestinian side, which is for 10 seconds, OK? 
okay? Um, the, the, the distrust and skepticism uh, on the Palestinian side, on the, on the West Bank part of this divided um, uh, Palestinian society and these fractured Palestinian politics, uh, the distrust and skepticism regarding the United States is extremely, extremely deep. And, um, you know, the U.S. faces, a, you know, a bit of a quandary. Um, if we want to see a united Palestine for, um, you know, negotiating purposes, and we want to reach out to Hamas, which we are less capable of doing than the Israelis because of... Uh, domestic politics and the legislation that domestic politics on this issue have produced uh, in the United States, then we're doing more or less what the Israelis have done in terms of validating Hamas and at the same time, by implication, um, demonstrating the weakness and irrelevance of, of, of Abu Mazen. So it's really problematic. And, and as we do that, as we wound the Fatah leadership, um, in this way, as we essentially derogate, you know, from their uh, from their authority, their distrust is only going to increase. And as we saw in 2012, culminating uh, in a very strong pitch that the United States made to Abu Mazen to stand down on the UN vote on on uh, uh, non-member state status for Palestine in, in the UN, um, we we are not heard anymore on the West Bank, you know, so our influence on that side of the house has diminished, it seems to me, very greatly and, and will be very difficult to recoup. Bob. I have the magic, magic answer, but I'm, I'm going to convey it privately to, uh, to the administration. <laughs> um, so now what I'm going to do is, is pick up rather on a point I think I, that, that I think is important for the administration, but for everyone to, to, to bear in mind. Um, I think we're coming to the end of an era of the Palestinian national movement. I mean, things are changing. Abu Mazen is the last representative of a generation, of a group among, within a generation that believed in negotiations, in good relations with the US, in good relations with Israel, cooperation with Israel in order to achieve a negotiated solution. And he, in the skepticism that he's expressing today about that, uh, he's expressing the skepticism of the last person who still held faith mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, in the, the mode of politics that he was engaged in. If this chapter closes without progress towards a two-state solution, I think we're in for a long period where the Palestinian National Movement is going to be searching itself, but also searching for a different way forward. And that's the real danger, I think, for Israel, for the Americans, and potentially for the Palestinians as well. Uh, the mode of politics in which they've engaged has exhausted itself because they really, you know, if you look at the, since Oslo, yeah. they, it's, it's achieved virtually nothing for the Palestinians. I'm sure the Israelis could have similar complaints, but from a Palestinian point of view, how could somebody, how could Abu Mazen, how could Salam Fayyad, how could anyone stand up and say, look what we brought to you? They brought them virtually nothing. And, and if, again, if this chapter closes, and this is the way it's going to close, I think. Uh, we have to, and this would be one piece of advice, we're going to have to get accustomed to a very, very different reality on the Palestinian side. And I'm not only talking about Hamas. Tamara. Um, well, Rob's declared uh, the end of an era for the Palestinian national movement. I'm, I'm going to declare the death of something else, um, which is that I think if we really want to rescue the two-state solution, we have to acknowledge that the Oslo peace process is over. Mm -hmm. uh, and we ha that doesn't mean that we set aside the agreements that were reached during that period, um, but we set aside the framework, the diplomatic framework that Oslo consists of, which says the period we're in now is a period of final status negotiations over Jerusalem and borders and refugees and settlements. Um, that's not where the parties are, as we've just been discussing. And a, a negotiation that is structured uh, around that framework doesn't meet the interests of the parties. So if we want to try and get from where we are today to something closer to a two-state solution, or even something that, as Rob was suggesting, an interim something that preserves the possibility of a two-state solution, we should not be driving toward final status talks. And I hope that we quit talking about that. Dan. I disagree. 
Right. There we go. <laughs> I, think, I think it was Billy Crystal in The Princess Bride who said that the something was only partly dead, not fully dead. <laughs> I don't think Oslo is fully dead. And certainly in the Middle East, where you're not really dead until you're dead and buried, uh, this process is not yet dead and buried. Um, if the secretary still has this issue as his priority, and if the president has the secretary's back, I would whisper five things in the president's ear and the secretary's ear. Number one, US terms of reference for negotiations, US parameters on all the core issues. Rob is right that previously the United States was focused a lot on the mechanics of getting to negotiations. We now know, based on negotiations that did take place, approximately where the parties had left off a few years ago. Different government in Israel, for sure, but the, the gaps are manageable if you can uh, both articulate them and then negotiate. So it's terms of reference with a US commitment to play a serious role in narrowing those gaps. Number two, um, <clears throat> a very heavy hand with um, Abu Mazen that uh, we're happy with the progress that's been made so far in institutionalization of the Palestinian state, but we're ready to do more if he's going to be serious. So it's a real investment in the kinds of things that Tamara was doing for four years in, in the State Department. Number three, um, the roadmap, which is also not yet dead and buried, has obligations that the two sides technically are still committed to. We appoint a senior monitor and hold them accountable. There has to be some accountability for what they do and they don't do. Frankly, Palestinians have done pretty well, according to their roadmap obligations, and the Israelis have not. Well, there have to be consequences if that's the case. Number four, um, security. General James Jones, who was both a security coordinator for the Bush administration and then national security advisor, did up a security outline, which is still classified, and it ought to be revived because security is going to be critical for both sides, not just for Israel, but also for the Palestinians. And five, you take what happened this week, which is the willingness of the Arab world to step forward again with its uh, ideas for peace, but they can't just sit back and wait now. They've got to be part of this process in some way. Back in the good old 90s, we brought them into so-called multilateral negotiations. Why not today when you've got problems of uh, climate change and health and uh, economics and water and, and who knows that are being held in abeyance pending a resolution of the bilateral conflict. You can actually accomplish something while you're also working these other issues. But this requires a, it's, a, it's an industry of peace activities. That's what I would whisper to the All president. All right. Thank you. That may be the perfect place to move to questions. And I, I will say, look, look, give our panel some hands. They are, they're they're going to keep working, though, so they're going to earn another hand at the uh, end of this. We'll move to questions now from the audience, and I, I will just take a moment to say what I mean by questions. Questions <laughs> should be shorter than any of the statements that our panelists have made, and they should end with a question mark indicating that <laughs> our panelists should uh, answer that. So let's start off with you, sir. Uh, Ted Katouf, I want to thank the panel. I thought it was a very balanced and very good discussion. But I want to pick up where Dan left off, where he said, OK, the roadmap, it was our roadmap. It was done under a very pro-Israeli administration, George W. Bush. And uh, the Palestinians under with Salam Fayyad in the lead largely did what they were asked to do, uh, particularly on settlements. Israel did not. Uh, and as Dan indicated, there's been a continuous lack of accountability, I think in part because of domestic U.S. politics. Uh, but this administration, the current administration, blinked big time uh, when Netanyahu uh, refused to go along with the settlements freeze. And with all respect to Senator Mitchell, and I do respect him a lot, uh, the so-called moratorium, uh, I'd like to count on how many, how many housing starts there were during the, the moratorium. So I think we've let Fayyad down big time. Uh, and the question is this, uh, how long are we, how long we, how long should we protect Netanyahu and those to the right of him from the consequences of their actions internationally? We vetoed 
and I expected us to veto. We vetoed a resolution on settlements that used our language. We opposed the Palestinians going to the UN for recognition as a state. So, I'll, I'm coming to the end. So Okay. And now the next step is the ICC, if we don't do so. <laughs> All right. To the panel. I think the question mark came after how long are we going to protect Netanyahu and others on the right question mark. Yes. I, I actually don't think the United States is effectively able to protect Israel from those international diplomatic consequences at this point. And I think we saw that in the statehood vote, uh, where there was a literal, a, a literal handful of countries voting with the US and Israel on that. Um, and frankly, I, I, my sense in the conversations I've had with Israelis over the last several months is that that sense of growing diplomatic isolation internationally uh, and the sense that they are losing goodwill they built up carefully over decades of diplomatic work in Europe and elsewhere is one of the only factors that seems to be motivating this Israeli government to demonstrate any flexibility. Other comments from the panel? Not, let me move over here. I want to thank the panel and a lot of discussion about the, uh, the reasons why it's unlikely that there'll be any movement in the peace process. There's a quote, um, I think it was Herbert Stein who said, something that can't last forever won't. I think I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he said. And isn't the, I guess my question is, is the occupation, the, 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 the status quo where, where um, there are millions of Palestinians who are, you know, who are occupied by Israel, whose, whose territories are occupied by Israel, isn't that something that can't last forever? I, I realize there's different ways it can end, uh, and I'm not getting, I'm not saying that it's that I'm not taking sides on who's right or wrong, but I'm, but I'm just saying, isn't that something that can't last forever? Uh, when, in the early 1980s, when I was at the Wilson School, if somebody had said, you know, 10 years from now, the Berlin Wall will be down, the Soviet Union will be gone, uh, and um, China will be a capitalist country, that person would have been considered a visionary, or that would, that was, that would have been considered unlikely <laughs> scenarios. In, in other words, things, it's, it's things like seems are gonna last forever, but they don't, and isn't the occupation one of those things? That's my question. Isn't the occupation destined to end it's something that can't go on forever? Uh, I, I'd say, uh, you know, that's, I think that's actually conventional wisdom, that it's unsustainable. But I'm reminded of what Secretary Clinton said a few years ago. She said, the status quo is unsustainable. It may last another five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years. 30 years for Israeli and Palestinian leaders, that's a very, for any political leader, that's sustainable. I mean, nothing has been more sustainable than some configuration of what we now have Israel-Palestine. So I think things are going to happen. There may be an uprising. There may be violence. But that doesn't give me enough comfort to say, therefore, therefore what? Therefore, it's gonna, we're going to see a two-state solution. Things won't stay static. But that doesn't mean that there can't be a wait for the, unfortunately, for the current realities on the ground to, to continue for some time, if an effort isn't made to change them. Or get worse. Or get worse. Yeah. Anybody else? I would just add, uh, 25 years ago, I was writing speeches for George Shultz, and we coined the phrase, the occupation is a dead end street. Everybody said it was a great phrase, and it says the <laughs> United States is committed to end the occupation. You know, Ro uh, Rob is right. Um, you could make that statement every five years, and it's going to be real problematic. So just assuming that it has to come to an end is not enough. There's human agency involved here, and that's, that's what we're talking about. And I think what Herb Stein said was, if something is unsustainable, it will end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Myrna Gallick, MPA 07. Thank you all so much for the really great discussion. Um, I have a very quick question. Um, given that Congress, as we saw in 2011, isn't willing to take the domestic political hits that would be necessary to support the president in pushing the Israelis to take some of the steps that we all recognize they need to take to get to peace, how do we actually get to peace? And I mean that as a practical question, not a philosophical statement. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, the interesting thing about 2011 is that we remember it as Netanyahu slapping down Obama, which is true, but we have a tendency to forget that the Palestinians also didn't accept the president's um, speech. And so the president's retreat at that time, and it's nothing less than a retreat, in a sense was looking at both sides. One, I think, who humiliated him publicly, but the other who rejected what he had to say privately. The question now is whether or not the president has decided with the mandate of a second term 
that he wants to go back at this again. And that's, I think all of us have basically either said or implied that it's gonna require presidential backbone. If he's in this for a short cruise, where at the first sign of problems, whether it's on the ground or a political issue in either constituency or some spoiler or whatever it is, the president walks away, then I would agree with everybody to say, better not to start down that path. But if he has the backbone, then he's got to stare down both sides and try to move this thing forward. I'd like to add a coda to that, which is that you're talking about a president who actually was willing and did take political risks on this issue in his first term, and he did it three times. In 2009, with the settlement freeze, which um, many people regard as having been a tactical error, but it was nothing if not uh, a throwing down of the gauntlet um, in domestic political terms. He did it again in September of 2010, um, when he tried to bring the parties together for direct talks in the wake of what had happened the previous year, which was in itself audacious, um, uh, I suppose. And then uh, the speech in May 2011, where he put forward the requirements uh, for peace and, and, and then faced the blowback that, that he got. I mean, he, he was willing to take serious political risk. And it seems to me that in a second term, at least in the first 18 months of the second term, given that track record, he might be even more prepared to take uh, risks than he had been in the first term. But uh, this is not a shrinking violet. Can I just add one quick note without making this too long? Because I'm a little concerned that we're talking too much about pushing and we're not talking, we're not picking up on something Steve said earlier, which is about pulling. Israelis and Palestinians in the direction we want them to go. Steve talked about the, the necessity of working over time to change the strategic perceptions of these decision makers. And I think that's a really crucial element here. And it's, it's a long game. Um, but I don't think it, it needs to be a generational game. And given that the region itself is so dynamic, we don't know where those opportunities are going to come to drive that point home. So I think that's another way to change the political calculus that you describe. Uh, if the Israelis are less dug in, then Congress will be less risk averse. Yes. Congratulations, Mr. President. Wait. It is my turn, please. I want to be courteous, actually, too. Actually, Mr. I we're, I do have a I, short question. You have a short question? Go ahead. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's why is there no Palestinian on this panel? And secondly, you have, I think you should think about, and Mr. Dr. Uh, Daniel knows about this, how about the Islamic world's view of the situation, not just ours and Israel's? And this has been forgotten. It's an elephant in the room. We, I think we've forgotten about it. Am I correct? Well, there are no Israelis on this panel either. So, uh, you know, it's a different kind of panel, which we often do at the Woodrow Wilson School, but not today. We happen to be Americans. Uh, but, but, but also, I don't think, I mean, maybe we didn't do fully justice to it. I think we've tried to take into account the perspective of the Palestinians. A number of us have spoken about that. And I, what, I tried, what I said at the beginning when I said that the two-state solution is swimming against the tide, it's because the most dynamic parties, forces, in all in three entities, Israel, Palestine and the broader Arab and, and, and Muslim worlds are not particularly enamored with a two-state solution as we would define it. It doesn't mean that it can't be done, but it means that ideologically, the most dynamic forces, who may not be majority forces, but they're the ones who are more who are who are making their presence felt on the street and elsewhere, have a different view. It's more along the lines of what Steve described, maybe some kind of coexistence where you, you maintain your ideological virginity and you don't have to make the kind of compromises on Jerusalem, on the right of return, on recognition of a Jewish state. And so that kind of pragmatic coexistence is more in tune with today. It doesn't mean that it's what the US should be pushing for, but it is more, more harmonious with the, the views of, of the relevant part of the, of the dynamic parties. 
Yeah. Sir, you have the last question, and then I will uh, let our speakers have a last word if they want to take one. Right. Go ahead. Uh, it's two questions are very quick. One is for Rob. You've written very eloquently about essentially the death of the two-state solution in, in a lot of wonderful pieces. In the, I haven't. In the, uh, in the New York Review of Books. They, the, the, anyway, I want, you to, I want you to spell out what you think an interim period looks like between the, the end of this phase that you've talked about and the beginning of a phase that would, that would have a whatever the, 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 the thing you and Hussein Aga write about is the future uh, parameters of the negotiations to, to, to be possible. Uh, and for you, Steve, I'm, I'm curious as to, since you were involved in these so closely, what were the actual costs of uh, the failure of these, these uh, gambits by the president? And at what point do the costs for us, for the United States, become so high that, that being, being involved uh, uh, is prohibitive? I may have been eloquent, but I obviously wasn't clear because I, I never <laughs> said, I, I don't know what it means to say the two-state solution is dead. I, I don't know how you take the pulse of the two-state solution. And I think the biggest threat today is not settlements, although that obviously is making a, a big difference. I think it's what's happening in people's minds. And once people completely give up and turn away from it, it's going to be hard to revive. But I think what you're referring to in articles that Hussein Aga and I wrote is, is reflecting on the point that I started off with, which is, you know, we could all say we know what the two-state solution looks like. We know the parameters. Dan said that, and I think we all would agree. Um, we could all say that we want the U.S. to be active and we, with politics to be right. But we have a track record now of many, many years where it has failed, despite knowing what the solution is, despite having, at times, an activist U.S. president. As, as Steve said, President Obama was quite active. I think lessons have to be learned about what, on the substance of the agreement and the way we've, we've gone about trying to, to, to pursue it, What's gone wrong so that we don't simply repeat the same thing? And again, it's not simply a matter of trying better what has failed in the past, because if it's failed, doing more of the same is not going to work. And it does mean, I think, looking more closely at why it is that some of these, what I'd call, call the core issues about Israel insisting on being recognized as a Jewish state and the Palestinians having their own narrative issues that are coming to the fore, it means that there's, it's not simply a technical question of what's the percentage of land. It means trying to trying to resolve what is really at the heart of this, of this dispute, which is difficult, which is not something that's in our nature as a nation to look at the narrative of both sides, but it's going to have to be done if we want to overcome uh, the obstacles that we haven't overcome in the past. Uh, the costs of, of failed initiatives, is that, is that the question? Yeah, the political cost, I think, for the United States of, of failure when we try to bring this, the two sides together. Well, I think there's a, there's a certain you know, diminishing credibility that the U.S. suffers when it goes all out to do something. It, it, it bets its prestige on a diplomatic uh, gambit and then uh, you know, can't make it work. I'd only add to that that um, credibility uh, and the heightening of it or lessening of it is not a, a one-way linear thing. In other words, States can suffer a loss of credibility, but then regain it. I mean, it's not a permanent loss. I am, as promised, going to turn to our panelists and ask if any of them want to say a last word about uh, this uh, topic, at least for this afternoon. <laughs> I, I would just actually build on something Steve just said. If you, one of the, the most interesting lessons from the, the 1990s, um, especially the last couple of years of the Clinton administration, I think they're quite instructive today. You remember those last couple of years, Clinton became almost manic about the peace process, and there was certainly no doubt about his um, desire to try to, to break the mold and to, to reach an agreement. And everything failed miserably. I mean, we had failure of the Syrian-Israeli track, failure of the Palestinian track, an intifada, you name it. But in that same period, we were getting, diplomatically, tremendous credit in the Arab world for trying. Now, you know, we're in a university, you don't get a mark for effort. You only get a mark for the grade, you know, the, the, <laughs> you hand in. And that's messages to my students in the audience, by the way. <laughs> but the fact is that in diplomacy, you do get credit for effort. And when the United States is active, engaged, and perceived as serious about this peace process, we get credit in the Arab world on issues that are unrelated to the peace process, Arab Spring, Arab Awakening, whatever you call it, Iran, Syria. And in itself, that becomes an important uh, part of this process as well. That was a good way to end. We will, we will end exactly there. Thank you.